When Funmaster Mike was a kid, it was all about Kasparov versus Karpov. They played about a million times. Now everyone I knew, including me, we wanted to play like Kasparov. In fact, a lot of what we do on Chess Kit is more Kasparovian. All of those tactics and puzzles and fun open positions. But you know what? I would almost argue it made me a better chess player learning how Karpov won. He was the world champion right in between Bobby Fischer and Garry Kasparov. What Karpov did so well was limit the opponent's counterplay, squeeze the opponent, simplify into winning positions, and above all, he would start his move by thinking about what the opponent wanted to do hmm. and then stop that. It's kind of strange. When you woke up this morning, you didn't think, hmm, what does my sister want for breakfast? You thought about yourself, but not Karpov. He thought about the other person. Let's see how Karpov squeezes his opponents. Now in this position, it looks like black has a lot less space and black plays the move queen d8. Hmm, might want to get inside the head of your opponent. Hmm. Why is black moving the queen backward? Well, black has less space. So black probably wants to trade rooks and then swing the other rook over and have the support of the queen. And this one move by Karpov stops black from having any fun for the next 20 moves. Bishop to a7, and that bishop, it's kind of like a wedge, yeah. And now black can almost never move anything on the queen side. The rest of the game is just black suffering, and watch how Karpov is never in a hurry to win. So first of all, he doubles up his rook, and the black pieces are basically just shuffling around. Now some of white's moves are a little bit random. I think Karpov was just trying to get to the 40 move time control, okay? And now black plays f6, and Karpov says, I'll take some more space. And then all Karpov does is he looks at his three minor pieces and says, how can I get my bishop, my knight, and my other knight to good squares? There is no rush. Why is there no rush? Because white has stopped all counterplay on the queen side with this one bishop. So he curls his bishop, that's his worst bishop, into the position to make a trade. And then notice knight to g4 is not a blunder because if things start taking on h5 there's gonna be a discover check i'm sure you figured that out okay then karpov trades bishops but he offers a queen trade under his own terms if black takes white takes and then white has the two most beautiful knight outposts in the history of chess so black just has to keep moving the king around and actually black resigned right here because mate is threatened and if you guard the mate with a move like queen here knight to g4 is just game over a very typical karpovian win nothing too exciting but you don't need excitement to get on the scoreboard this next position was actually given to fun master mike at a chess camp and we have a kind of a funny story here Half of us played white, half of us played black. Every single person that played the correct move as white in this position, that would be Karpov's move, won the game. Everybody else who did not play Karpov's move either made a draw or, in one case, actually lost the game. Now, I actually got about 30 minutes to look hmm. at this position. I don't know how much time you have on your hands, but why don't you pause your videos and figure out what move did Karpov as white play in this position? Well, if you're back, I hope you put yourself in the opponent's shoes and you figured out what does black want to do? If you ask yourself that question, you are on the way to being the next Karpov. What does black want to do? He wants to move his bishop down to d1 or to c2 to start pressuring either your pawn or your knight. So Karpov played bishop to b3. Every single student that played that move went on to win the game. Now it does take a while because after the bishops traded, you do have to figure out how to get your pawn to the other side. Let's take a look at how Karpov did that. We're not gonna spend too much time, but he does oh. activate oh. his king. That allows his knight to be able oh. to move, and he actually swaps his worst pawn for the d-pawn. That gives him a passed pawn, but look at how slowly he promotes this passed pawn. So first, he pins the pawn on f7. Oh, no. Actually, the threat was the move knight to g5. Now he comes behind the king. He's thinking about moving his rook to e8. So the bishop moves back. That way he could play f6 in response to rook e8. Okay, rook check. Now you can't block because we have this trick. Knight takes e5. So the king runs away. Knight to g5 check forces the king back. 
Rook check, and look at how slowly he is overwhelming the black forces. Bishop f8 is the only move. Now rook c7 forces yeah. the pawn to come forward, Yikes. and that allows his knight to get to a great outpost. And you can see all of black's pieces are just sitting there waiting, and eventually Karpov does decide that it is time to win the game. Couple of random checks. He finally pushes his passed pawn, and after a couple more random checks, which basically mean nothing, he plays knight to c7. The idea is to get the knight to the square d5, which totally overwhelms black's position. And here, he actually played knight to d5 anyway, and black resigned because the discovered attack on the rook, and I'm sure everyone sees if rook takes, knight takes, and white is going to be up 1 million pawns. Now, kind of a funny story if we go back to our starting position. Remember I said that at least one kid actually lost the game? How could you possibly lose as white? Well, let me show you. One child played the very unfortunate move, bishop to b5. And of course, trading would be nice, but black's not gonna trade. Black's down a pawn and black activated the bishop. And now in this position, if you move the knight, you lose the pawn. So white played g5, black took, white took. Now things are already bad for white because the bishop can start taking things. But black went for more and played rook all the way down to a1 check. Of course, if you block with your bishop, bishop e2 is putting pp on the pp. So the king ran away, and then black found an amazing mating net. Black played the move g5, and white's in huge trouble. Let me give you an example. Pretend white plays bishop to d3 to defend the pawn. Then we get rook check, king up, and then the majestic pawn to g4, and the rook comes to h3 for mate on the next turn. That's what happens when you don't limit the counterplay of your opponent. And you know what? White is actually completely lost anyway, because even if white oh. traded pawns oh. and then tried to have his king run, black would play g4 anyway with the idea of playing rook h1, rook h3. And if the king goes on a walk, we still play rook h1. And when the king keeps on walking here, kitty, kitty, we play the amazing clearance sacrifice pawn to g3. And no matter what white does, okay, he could play a couple of checks. But oh. if he takes, rook to h5 is mate. That's what happens when you don't think about your opponent's pieces. Moving on, we've got one more Karpov win to show you. Karpov was white here against Vishy Anand. Ever heard of him? Yeah, he's the chess kid ambassador in India. Now, it's a very complicated position, but you can see Karpov's rook's in danger, and this queen has all kinds of checks that can annoy white. So in this position, it's a wide open board, but Karpov found a way to simplify into a winning endgame. He didn't care how long it would take. He played queen takes g7. Look at that queen sacrifice. Because after oh. king takes, we grab this knight, king has to move somewhere. We take the other knight, which removes the guard of our rook. And after oh. queen takes, I'm sure you could make a guesstimate that two rooks and two connected pass pawns are going to be better than a queen. Now, a funny story. This is move 33. It actually took Karpov until move 108 to win the game. Do we have time to explain all of those moves? No, we do not, because Fun Master Mike is contractually obligated not to have videos go that long. So we're going to hit the massive fast forward button, and let's take a look at the rest of the moves on high speed warp speed. Was it fun for you? I hope you were dancing the whole time. And you can see in this position, the black king's in bad shape. White already has one pass pawn. The queen is stuck. Another pass pawn can march up the board. And it was finally time to give up for Anon. Now, how can you learn from these examples? Well, let me see how Fun Master Mike learned from these examples. I'm remembering a game I played many years ago where I was white. And in this position, I was really worried about the enemy queen doing something to me like attacking my weak pawns. So I first made a trade, but then I really got inside the head of my opponent. That was key. Is the black knight a bad piece here? Yes, it is. But it's not going to be bad for much longer. In fact, if black moves the bishop, the knight has an awesome square targeting my weak pawn. Even coming around this way could be a problem because if the knight gets to c4, he will be forking my pawns. 
So in this position, I know it might look tempting to play a move like bishop e2, but that just helps your opponent play bishop c8 and then uncover that dream square for the knight. So only by figuring out that this knight was going to be a great piece did it occur to me that bishop d6 was the best move. Now my opponent's got to be careful because if he plays knight to d7 now, bishop to e2 does win this pawn because the bishop can't go backward. That was key. So black played bishop c8, obviously wanting his knight to get in the game, but I took getting rid of it. Now in this position, I again got inside the head of my opponent. My opponent has a lot of pawns on light squares, and we are in a bishop ending. He wants to get his pawns off the light squares. So can you figure out what I did? Pawn to b4, Anatoly Karpov, come right over and give me a high five. I'm sure you approve of that move. That fixes this pawn on the a6 square. We say that pawn has cement boots. And then it did take a while to win this game. But again, I figured out in this position, my opponent wants to play king here and get rid of his weak pawn. So Karpov, a4, there we go. And after king b6, a5, now that pawn really has cement boots on. And of course the king cannot activate because king c3 is a wicked discovered check winning the pawn. So black had to move the king backward. It did take a few more moves, but I did break through on the king side because my opponent was permanently stuck guarding this pawn. It wasn't the fastest way to win, but it was Karpovian. Remember, you get no extra points for winning a game quickly. Everybody knows about Fisher and Kasparov, but don't sleep on Karpov. He has many good lessons to teach us.